Welcome to the Arrive Podcast, the U.S. Immigration Law Podcast for Canadians. I am Jeremy Richards, and I'm here with my business partner and fellow immigration attorney, Christine Jerusik. Together, we are Richards and Jerusik Immigration Law, practicing U.S. immigration law from our offices in Buffalo, New York, and Toronto, Ontario. And we help Canadians to work and live in the United States. If you haven't already, please follow and like us on your podcast app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Richards and Jerusik Immigration Law. And follow us and like us on on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram uh, for regular updates on U.S. immigration law uh, that we have created just for Canadians. Uh, In addition, on our website, there is a resources tab where you can subscribe to a weekly newsletter where you will receive all our recent updates and posts about U.S. immigration law as well. So we're going to just jump right in today with um, some new updates to U.S. immigration Um, The H-1B lottery closed. And that closed at a different day than expected because on it was supposed to close on the 17th, which was a Friday, but USCIS had some technical difficulties and they extended it until the following Monday. I forget which day that was. The 20th, I think, is when to the close of business on the 20th. So they gave people an extra three days to get into the lottery. But it did close. Which and they is only know. fair. I mean, it, the technical difficulties were on them. So, Yeah, and they don't always do what's fair with USCIS. <laughs> Usually they say tough luck. So yeah. one, thing, one good thing they, they actually did to favor people. Um, but they announced they made all the selections, and that was completed. Um, right, so not only did it close, but now the lottery's been run and the selections have been made for this year. Um, hopefully, if you're listening, you were selected, but chances are... Your Probably chance was a, based yeah. on our calculations, and we'll see when the official numbers come out from USCIS. And this was around what we guessed, about 10% of the people that entered got in. That was really low. Very low. Now, and if you want to know if you were selected or your employer wants to know, they should have got a notification in their USCIS account. And when you go into that account, it'll say selected. And when you, when you go in there, it'll have a selection notice, an official notice from USCIS indicating that you were selected. And pay attention because if you were selected, there is a window by which to file the official petition to take advantage of that selection. Uh, and That's we'll right. talk about that a little bit uh, later on in our conversation. But uh, make sure you take advantage of that and you do it properly because if you don't, uh, then you will lose out on your ability to, to file. And that would be by June 30th is when you oh, have that's to have a deadline petition. To yeah, June 30th. Okay. And if you're not, uh, if you don't get, do that, then um, it'd be put back in the pool and you lose out on your lottery registration. Which brings us to the, the point that is there going to be another selection? I mean, if you're, if you haven't been selected, um, it looks like they haven't closed out your your registration. So is there a chance you could get chosen in the lottery again? Or are they going to run it again? In the years past, yes. They've done a reselection is what they would call it. And so what happens is you have until June 30th to submit your petition. If it's not submitted by June 30th, then USCIS can choose to reallocate that selection to somebody else. And they do what's called a reselection process. And in years past, somewhere end of July, August is when they would notify people of a reselection. Or you'd be officially notified that you were not selected at all. So you will remain right now until they do that. It'll either say selected or not selected. Or if you really messed up, it'll, it'll say that the improper fees, fees weren't collected and you missed out. Or you were denied because you had a duplicate registration or you did something you weren't supposed to. So those are the four possible uh, indications on your account. But hopefully you were either selected or not selected yet, and it's just pending. Uh, and they'll update that letter later and, and say you, you are not selected once they complete that reselection process. So it looks like, um, you know, some people may have been calling in and asking, can you, can you transfer that selection? So if you've been selected in the lottery for your employer, um, you know, some time has passed. Perhaps you're looking at another employer. Can you, can you transfer that selection and, and have a new employer file the petition? Very good question. And we do get asked this a lot. 
um, you don't own that selection as the employee. Right. The employee is the person uh, that is indicated that the employer wants to sponsor for an H-1B. So when you get this selection notice, it indicates it has some key information on there. One is the date that we just discussed by which you have to file that petition. And there's also a section on there that talks about the employer and who the employer that selection is for. So it's attached to that specific employer who submitted that lottery registration. And it also indicates the employee for which the employer submitted a lottery registration. Neither of those can be changed. The employer can't transfer that to another employer who wants to take advantage of it. And they cannot substitute the employee either. And the employee doesn't own it. So the employee can't take that somewhere else. The employer can't assign it to another employer. And the employer can't substitute the employee. If any of those details change, if a petition is filed by an employer not listed, then it'll be denied or rejected. If it's filed for an employee not listed, it'll be denied or rejected. So it is only valid for the employer and employee listed on that selection notice. Right. So uh, USCIS has come out with some um, new updates, letting us know of uh, some changes to their processes and procedures. First one being uh, some changes to timing and filing. And this is an amazing change. And, and, right, and we, we just you. we just said that USCIS it's, it, doesn't. It's so it makes so much sense. Oh yes. So the, they changed what it means, what what their definition of a timely filing is, in response to an agency request. So an agency request would be something such as a request for evidence, of a notice of intent to deny, a notice of intent to revoke, um, notice of continuance, all no. of those things or yeah, any of those where yeah. they're requesting something. And on those notices, it has a deadline. It tells you, you need to reply by in 33 days from this notice, or it'll give an exact date by which you have to reply. Traditionally, what USCIS has done is they've, they have only counted your, your response as received when they acknowledge the receipt. And that's, that was complicated in the past because if you, let's say your, your action date for USCIS or the date by which they needed to receive your response fell on a Saturday, a Sunday, or even a Monday that was a federal holiday, right. and it was received over the weekend, let's, they would count it as a late filing or a late response. Because it, they don't officially receive it until they open for business the next business day, which could be, let's say, a Tuesday. But you filed it in a timely manner. They just didn't open it until Tuesday or even a Monday because it got there on a Saturday or Sunday. And they would reject or deny your case because they weren't open. <laughs> they yeah. got it, and it's sitting in their mailbox, but they didn't open it yet. Well, they changed that. Now, if your case is submitted and it arrives on a Saturday, a Sunday, or a federal holiday, it will count, it, it, they will count it as being timely responded or filed on the next, by the close of the next business day. Right. So they add that time. So in some cases, you could get Saturday, Sunday, and a Monday if that's a federal holiday, or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday if the Friday was a federal holiday. Yeah. And so it, it could move to the, close of business on that Monday or the close of business on that Tuesday and it would still be considered a timely filing. So yeah, great. We, I mean, we try to file everything well in advance of that. So there's never any question as to whether it's received in time, but there is instances where it's not possible or, you know, maybe you're an attorney that likes to work at the 11th <sighs> hour. Um, you know, this is really going to benefit those practices and, and really help people out. So I think it's a good change. Yeah, in, in our practice, we typically give a false deadline to our clients. <laughs> this is when lying to your client is good. <laughs> you shouldn't lie. But we tell them, we give them a false deadline, right? Most of the time. Well, we give them the deadline where... Two weeks ahead. We need it mm -hmm. by this date so we can get it in by that date so that we're not messing around with these filing deadlines. Right, because it's not like we're just submitting their, their evidence, throw, getting it, throwing it in an envelope and sending it out. We have to add our legal argument to it. So... 
Um, there is, you know, work product that needs to be done. So, yeah, we, we kind of move it up. And, and yeah, we give a false deadline so that we can prepare it and have time mm, to get it in there. And get it done correctly. And this just gives us a little bit more time, which yeah, is some amazing. Some wiggle room, which is nice. All right. And there are a couple more updates. USCIS ended the COVID flexibilities. So they giveth and they taketh away. That went on for, wow, how long did that go on? Two plus years yeah. they did that, right? Yeah. They finally acknowledge that there are no delays with COVID anymore, and they're back to regular, regular uh, business. And you're no longer giving; they're no longer giving extended uh, response times for those requests. Right. So we had received an extra sixty days um, to respond to those requests because of COVID, um, which was, uh, you know, very nice. And I think a lot of us got used to uh, working within those timelines, but now those timelines are ending. So if you receive a notice, I think it was, was it March 20, 23rd or something, 26th? So any notice that's re- that's received uh, dated, now? Yeah, dated now anyway, is, is going to be, needs to be filed by the actual deadline. No more extra 60 days. And this goes back to what we just talked about, right? Um, that uh, That filing date. So that timely filing would apply to these responses without the additional time to respond that USAIS was giving that extra 60 days. So if you receive a request for evidence and it has an actual date on the bottom of when you need to reply, then you need to reply by that date. There is no extension anymore. And this applies to anything that is dated by USAIS after March 23rd. Oh, 23rd, okay. So March 23rd and on, if you got a request from USCIS, that deadline applies. The the U.S. the additional COVID flexibilities are now gone. So make sure uh, you're responding in a timely manner again. One more update: USCIS has updated um, information on ability to pay. So an ability to pay, uh, if people aren't familiar with that, means when you're doing a green card application for foreign national. You have to show that you have the ability to pay the wages uh, to the, the foreign national that you're sponsoring. So if you're saying that uh, you're hiring um, somebody as a graphic designer and you're going to offer them $80,000 a year, uh, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have the ability to pay those wages uh, to that employee. And they've just updated the types of evidence that they will accept to demonstrate that you as an employer have the ability to pay that wage. So they've, they've opened up uh, and they accept more uh, financial evidence than they did in the past. It makes it a little easier on an employer to demonstrate their ability. So we have some uh, recent case results that we've received, um, approvals for clients uh, that have come through recently that are noteworthy. Yeah, so one of them actually, this just happened. I don't know what day it is. Oh, this. So this was, I think, Wednesday of last week. So we had a client who entered the United States as a student, and then, and this is a Chinese national uh, that entered as a student, and that student uh, then um, converted to an H one B and luckily got into the lottery. And this is when it was easier to get into the lottery. This case has been going on for. And I would like to say eight, eight plus years. Oh, wow. So it's been a while. Uh, went from student to H-1B visa. Then we actually did the green card process for this individual and got a, a perm approved for them. But the wait time for is based on your country. So the wait time for this individual still, if they were waiting with that process, would still be another four years from now. Uh, still be in line for a green card. But that individual entered into a program if through the U.S. military, and it was referred to as MAVNI. And uh, through that MAVNI program, the U.S. government promised U.S. citizenship for these individuals. But due to, you know, due to, you know, bureaucracy and, and everything that's involved uh, with immigration and, and politics and, and the military, that process was put on hold, and these individuals were put in limbo. There was only a few thousand that ever entered into it, and most of them ended up leaving the country and not taking advantage at all because oh, wow. they got the shaft from the government. Um, so there was a lawsuit about a year ago. I forget when the lawsuit was settled. 
just recently. It wasn't it wasn't quite a year ago, but it was recently. It was called Calixto. And through that settlement with the U.S. government, the government said, okay, you, or USAIS said, okay, we're going to honor the promise that was made to these individuals, and we're going to get them citizenship. So we filed for our client immediately for U.S. citizenship, and he was approved rather quickly. Within three months, it went from straight from H-1B visa to green card to oh, citizen. Wow. Never had a green card, <laughs> and that's not that's very common. It's very rare for that to happen. And based on our calculations, there's only a few hundred individuals left in the U.S. that even qualify for this program because they all left uh, because they were sick of waiting for the process. So one of one of very few individuals that was able to get their citizenship through that program. So uh, exciting. Yeah, it was exciting. And then we had a TN visa approval. Oh, no, TN to green card. Sorry. Yeah, this, this person started out as a management consultant. Yeah, so we have a, a had another, and this one was done through the consulate in Montreal. Actually, uh, very few employment-based green cards have gone through the consulate in recent years because of COVID delays. They've just recently started processing them. And this client we've been working with, and man, this is another one. It's been about ten years. Uh, he entered the United States. On a TN, we were able to get him a, a TN visa as a management consultant. And after a few extensions of the TN, uh, the employer agreed to sponsor for a green card through the PERM process. So EB, this would be EB2, employment-based process. And we got a PERM approval. But because of COVID, the interview has been delayed. This, I think he was first scheduled for an interview back in 2020. Oh, wow. And that was canceled because of COVID finally got the interview and then uh, has is now approved for immigrant visa and he happens to have a spouse and the spouse was approved as well so long journey come to an end but we emphasize this one because you can go from a tn visa to a green card and he's canadian spouse is canadian and they were able to go straight from tn visa to green card their process was uh delayed because of covid um but it is possible and and he is extremely excited to finally get his green card. That's great. And and his wife was actually waiting for a green card through sponsorship from her sister, who's a U.S. citizen. And we talked about this. The delays in that are over a decade, right? Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Very Almost two decades. Two decade, yeah. When it, well, it depends what country you're from, but... A long time. Yeah, yeah. So if they were still waiting for sponsorship through her sister, they'd still be waiting for, I think, who knows, another 10 years. So this cut that process, uh, processing time down significantly, and now they're U.S. permanent residents. That's great. Speaking of green cards, that process has really sped up at USCIS. So I think I had a TN last week that we filed um, probably the week before. Um, we got the approval notice, and we are in, in, I think, two days after we got the um, receipt notice. Uh, you're talking about? Through USCIS. A TN visa application? Yeah, a TN yeah. application TN. through USCIS. Yeah, it used to take Very months. Fast. Now it's less than a month. I mean, without this one premium was, <laughs> processing, right? This one was crazy fast, but yeah, it's. Is that standard processing? Standard processing. Yeah. So that, I mean, and that's, that's, that's something that's uh, good to oh, know. No, no, it wasn't. It was premium. It was premium? Yeah, it was premium processing. Yeah, but we have Still. had several standard processing in less than a month, too. I think my experience with premium processing is usually that they don't request do anything. For an at evidence. least a week, yeah, request for evidence, and they'll wait that full 15 days before they issue the approval notice. But this one just flew right through. But this is good for those that don't want that interaction at the border, right? A lot of people don't want that confrontational interview with a border officer when they apply for their TN. They're intimidated by it, and rightfully so. Sometimes it can be an intimidating process. So there is that option to file by mail with USCIS if you don't want to go and have that in-person interrogation, interview, whatever Mm -hmm. you might want call it, as long as you plan a little bit in advance. Even with premium processing, because you have to prepare the paperwork, it has to be approved, and then you have to get the approval notice to the individuals to take to the border to enter the u.s you should give yourself at least two months for that process to make sure it you have everything um 
And if you're doing standard processing, three months is fine. Uh, if you do the, do it in advance and you plan ahead of time, then it is possible to do it ahead of time by mail and avoid that that border interaction. So it's available. Yeah, and it's fast. And it's fast now, way faster than it used to be. Yeah. You used to have to pay that $2,500 premium processing no matter what. Or, you, or you'd wait four or five months. Now it's like, I think the standard processing is two or three weeks. Yeah, it's listed as two or three weeks right yeah. now on the USCS website. Yeah. So you had another TN approved. And this was another TN to green card. Yeah. Uh, this individual um, obtained a TN visa as a recreational therapist. This is a, a unique one. Mm -hmm. And what he what he does is he does music therapy for musicians who've been involved in catastrophic accidents and lost their ability or function to play their instruments. Oh, wow. They forgot or something, you know, maybe it's a physical or, or mental uh, injury that they had that impedes them from playing at the level they used to prior to the accident. And he does music therapy for these individuals to help them get back to, to form. So we were able to file that petition. Um, and uh, again, this is, was through the perm process. So same exact process, TN visa to green card, green card through EB2. And yeah, uh, now has his green card. Um, oh, and is able to be card. in the, yeah, and is nice. now uh, here in the U.S. as a U.S. permanent resident. Again, TN visa to green card. Uh, it is possible. We do it all the yeah. time. Uh, and it is the exact same process as an H-1B visa to green card. There is no difference in the process, especially if you're a Canadian. Um, the wait times, everything, it, it, there's no difference in this process. Uh, there, are, there is a time that you can't travel, and as long as you take into account, you you know, a few months that you can't travel while you're waiting for your green card, then it's a great process. Pretty seamless. All right, let's move on to some frequently asked questions uh, that we received this week. Uh, one of them was re with respect to what you can do as a permanent resident. Can you vote in the United States as a permanent resident? We've been hearing rumors that people have been uh, told they can vote in maybe in local elections or state elections, maybe not federal elec elections, or but there is some confusion out there as to whether or not voting is permitted. Um, even heard stories of people being, uh, you know, told that they can vote by certain political parties and representatives of that party. Um, but it, you know, to be clear, if you're a permanent resident of the United States, you cannot vote at all. At all. This even if even if the state law says it's okay to vote in your state as a permanent resident, you should not vote until you are a citizen of the United States. It will impact your ability to become a citizen if you do it before you're a citizen. Drastically. So yeah. if you want to, it, it could impact your ability to stay in this country. If they find out. As a permanent resident, if they find out that you registered and voted in the United States. And Shauna, she's another attorney in the office. She's the one that represents uh, those in removal proceedings or mm -hmm. deportation, as it's more commonly known. She's she see, she's has um, examples of individuals right now in removal proceedings who voted, and then yeah. they filed a naturalization appl application indicating that they'd vote, and they found out that these individuals had voted in an election. Now they're being removed from the United States because of that. Right. And these are, you know, legal green card holders came here legally, went through the process, have had the green card for years, made the mistake of registering to vote. This individual didn't even actually vote. They just all they did was register. Yeah. Well, the one you're talking about registered and voted and did yes. it willingly yes. and knowingly. Yeah. And that's a big no, no. So um, if you want to remain in the United States, do not vote as a permanent resident. Your best bet is just to Wait till you can become a citizen, become a citizen, and then you can vote in every election you want to. <laughs> and on that, too, so when you when you file for naturalization, they ask if you've ever voted, but they also ask if you ever put yourself out as a U.S. citizen. Sometimes those go hand in hand. You may yeah, have indicated so. that you are a U.S. citizen to then register to vote. If you do either of those, that could be very problematic for your green card and ability to get U.S. citizenship. So be very careful who you get your advice from. Those political operatives out there, they don't care. They just want your vote. And this happens all the time. 
Uh, they just want you to go to that voting booth and vote. They don't care what the consequences are for you. Yeah. So be careful. Yeah, you have to care about your own status more than they do, for sure. So speaking about permanent residence and what you can and can't do, this selective service registration, what is that requirement about? Yeah, and we've had several naturalization applications that we've been working on recently where they're younger individuals because you can qualify for citizenship at the age of 18 um, and apply for it. But if you are in the United States as a U.S. permanent resident and you're between the ages of 18 and 26, you are required to register for the U.S. Selective Service or what's more commonly referred to as the draft, which I don't think it's happened since the 70s. Yeah, but. they don't call it that anymore either. Yeah. What are they <laughs> Serving unwillingly in the military. I don't well, know what it's called. So yeah. the draft or selective service. So you have to register for that in the event that it, it, it does happen. You have to put your name in the pool, and that's called the selective service. That is a requirement. And It's only a requirement for men. It's not a requirement for women. Yeah, between the ages of 18 and 26. So if you are a U.S. permanent resident and you haven't registered and you're a male in the United States, then you need to register for the U.S. Selective Service. It's a simple process. You go online, fill in some information, and register. And it really means nothing, and it hasn't for decades, uh, but you must comply with it. It is a requirement. Yeah, especially if you want to become a citizen. Yeah, so, but don't be scared that if you do that, you're going to be forced to serve in the military. That's not how it works. Um and it hasn't it, that hasn't happened uh, for a long time. So and there, it, I mean, there's some exemptions to this too. So if you, I mean, married have children, like there's a priority thing too. Yeah, and I mean, even if you, if you forgot to register, so if you're a listener and you want to become a U.S. citizen, you're maybe you're a permanent resident, and you didn't know about this requirement, or you you know it, it the window's already closed. You're over 26. What are you supposed to do? You want to become a citizen now, but you never complied with this requirement. There are exemptions for that, so you just want to make sure that you comply with one of the exemptions. You fit into one of those before you naturalize. Yep. So be careful and make sure you understand your requirements as a U.S. permanent resident. So there's two we've discussed already uh, that could impact your ability to become a citizen. All right, moving on to E-2 visas. So, you know, we get a lot of inquiries around that uh, type of U.S. visa uh, the investor visa, as we like to call it. Um, and, and plenty of people want to know what kind of investments can work and count towards their E2 total because they all want to get you know to a level where their investment will help them to be approved with an application. You know, and, and that's often a question we get on the phone. How much do I have to invest? Well, it's, you know, there's no hard line rule. It depends on your business. But what actually counts towards that number? Yeah, and we go this, through this with clients, too, that are trying to put together their investment amount and uh, have that final calculation before they submit their application to the consulate. Um, the short answer is any legitimate business expense for that investment can count. It can be inventory. It can be office furniture. It can be computers, it can be utilities, marketing expense, professional expenses. So if you paid an attorney, if you paid an accountant, if you paid a business plan writer, all of that counts. You can even count uh, goods or um, inventory or equipment that you transfer, let's say from Canada to the United States. Mm -hmm. And we've done that many times. Yeah. Uh, we had one that we worked on where the sole investment was um was a brew I, I forget what you call it it was a something to make hops to, for in the brewing process there that was their sole investment they had made this um it was a distill i, I can't yeah, remember what so. it was <laughs> to I, make I the know. beer i don't make beer and so. it, <laughs> they had invested over a million dollars yeah. in this uh piece of machinery Oh, wow. And then they transferred that machinery to the U.S. to open up a brewery in the U.S. That was the sole investment. So that was over a million dollars, but they had to show what that was worth, what they put into it, and then they transferred that to the U.S., and that was the basis for their investment. And we've had clients transfer over uh, big rigs, 
construction oh, equipment. That's a common one for Constru- trucking yeah. companies. Yeah. Construction equipment. And then inventory, right? If you have a lot of inventory and that's mm-hmm. being used towards your investment. So the sky's really the limit. The main thing is that you track this. They have to be legitimate. It has to be on paper. You can't know. just say. I've seen USCIS take our fees off someone's uh, investment. Account. USCIS does. Yeah, they did. But the consulate I was a little doesn't. insulted, frankly. <laughs> yeah, the consulate doesn't. We know that for sure. No, the consulate doesn't, but the USCIS, yeah, USCIS does. Like, does what they You cannot feel like. count your lawyers, your legal fees towards your investment amount. Mm, yeah, yeah. They didn't it, like that. Uh, so the, so in any event, as long as you can document it, you have it on paper, mm-hmm. you can show where you got the money and where the money went, and there's a paper trail for it. If you are relying on existing equipment or goods, you have to have a valuation of it. So you can't just say what you think it's worth. Uh, if if you're transferring over a truck, for example, well, you have to show what that truck's worth yeah. if you want to count the value of it. If you, Let's say you have a business in the U.S. that requires a vehicle. Well, you can purchase a vehicle, and that can count towards your investment, too. Yeah. We just did one like that. Um, so one thing that I know we can't include is travel expenses. They don't like that. Travel, hotel stays, yeah, it's food not an expenses. That's not well, some people think that it is part of the investment because they because it's a went business to that ex- expense, right? Yeah. And they went to that expense in order to come in and make their investment or whatever they were doing yeah. in the U.S. But yeah, that is not something we can include. Yeah, it's that that's not considered an investment in the business right. in the enterprise. Yeah, uh, it may be a legitimate business expense, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that you could write off for tax purposes, but it it's not considered an investment in that enterprise in the United States. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, let's move on here. So I see we've received another question about trades at, uh, under the TN visa. You get this question all the time, actually. Yeah, true. Because the trades are in demand in the U.S. Uh, and it, we also get it for a lot of other professions in, that uh, are in demand in the U.S., like x-ray techs and sonographers and some other professions. Too. We, won't, we won't discuss those right now, but... So if you're working in the trades as a welder, boilermaker, carpenter, electrician, mechanic, um, even specialized trades that may deal with aircraft, none of those professions are listed under the USMCA professions list. Just because a profession isn't listed under the USMCA, it doesn't disqualify it for TN status as long as you can show that it fits within one of the professions. So what a lot of people try to do with these professions, these trades, is they try to fit it under the tech category of a scientific technician mm-hmm. technologist. Well, there's actually a memo that talks about this. And in that memo, it specifically excludes trades from that profession. So you can't qualify under as a scientific technician technologist if you're working in the trades. And those trades are not listed. And they really don't fit in any other profession. Um, unless you're an engineer, for example, but in that case, you're an engineer. So you qualify as an engineer. So in general, and I would say in most cases, if you're working in the trades, you're not going to qualify for TN status. Now, if an employer really needs you that bad to perform a trade in the United States and they want to go through the green card process and wait two years plus to get you here Mm -hmm. and sponsor you through the perm process, can they do that? Sure, they can. That's a lot of expense. And it's a lot of time to not have you working for them um, to, to do that process. And people often mix up those immigrant visas for non-immigrant visas, like a work visa. Those immigrant visas take a long time, and we're referring to as EB2, EB3, uh, visas, EB4. They can take a long time to get, years. So most employers aren't willing to do that investment to bring you into the U.S. without having you at least here working for them while you wait for it. Yeah. So if you're in a trade, unfortunately, the USMCA and the TN visa is not going to work for you. All right. So we've got some listener questions we received over the last week or so. First one is, I have a simple but also important question. As a Canadian citizen, can I apply for and obtain a TN1 at the U.S. land border port of entry? And then return to Canada, pack up my things, and then come back to the United States a few days later when I'm going for my employment. Is this allowed or is it going to be a problem? Could be a problem depending on, on how you do it, right? <laughs> yeah, it could be. I would say how what, and where? What, what percentage <laughs> of our clients do this? 90% uh, do yeah. this? 
Yeah, I would say they do. They, they want to know that they have that visa in hand before they go to the trouble of packing up their worldly goods and getting that U-Haul across the border. And, yeah, you can't get in a U-Haul and cross the border until you have the VC either. Right. So you put yourself in a, a difficult situation there. And uh, most people don't want to rent a house. They don't want to do any of that until they have that visa Which is hand. the smart way to do it. It's not, it do, doesn't make any sense. And we advise our clients, don't make any of these steps. Don't take them on, those steps until you have the actual approval. And, yes, you can do this, which you should not do. And this is what gets people into trouble is you don't show up to the border and say, I'm just here to get my visa and I'm going back to Canada. No, they will turn you around and they can turn you around if you say that. If you say you're coming to apply for your visa, which you are, to come and work in the U.S., which you are, then they will review it, approve your visa. Now, whether or not you stay in the U.S. for an hour or a week or a month after you're approved, that's up to you. Could you turn around and immediately go back to Canada? Sure, you can. Uh, don't tell the officer that your intention is just, I'm just here for to get my visa and turn around and go back to Canada. Then they will say, well, how about you come back when you're yeah, I don't plan have to on entering the U.S.? Today. When you're coming to work, then we can talk. Yep. Yeah. So you can do it. Just make sure when, you, when you're applying, you have to say you're, you're applying to come work, not just to get your visa. Right. Frame it properly. Another question we received is, I'm an executive on an L1A visa, which is a, a multinational executive or manager for a multinational company. And I lead a team that supports North America. But I'm living outside the U.S., and I have employees there in our U.S. office too. I guess this sounds like this person is working outside the U.S. the majority of the time, but has is supervising a international team here that has, is located maybe in multiple countries throughout the world. Is there any option for me to get a permanent residency to look for other jobs in the U.S. and actually live there without my employer sponsoring me? Yeah, this person's <laughs> trying to subvert their employer, right? Yeah. And go around them. So it's complicated in more ways than one, right? Because Sure. I mean, the answer is, yeah, sure, if you have another employer that can sponsor you. But when they put that caveat at the end, without my employer sponsoring me, there's no way to do a green card without a sponsor. Well, and not through this method. So if you're saying you want to come on an L1A and get a green card through this employer without them sponsoring, no, you can't do that. If you're getting an L1A, it's attached to that employer, and they're the sponsors for that green card. Um, and if you're coming and it says, and without my employer sponsoring me, no, you can't. Not, not in this situation. You can't do that at all. They have to be the sponsor. Either your current employer needs to sponsor you or some other employer needs to sponsor you. Um, you know, the best way to do it would be have your current employer sponsor you on a green card to come in um, and get get your green card. And then once you have that, you know, it, it's not very nice, but you could start looking for other jobs. But until that point in time, no, there's, you know. Yeah, and people don't understand that. They think that once you get a green card and your employer sponsors you, you can only work for that employer. Well, that's not true. Your intention should be to work for that employer, and that's the basis for which you get the green card. But once you have the green card, you're actually free to work wherever you want. Um, it could it would it could be problematic if you had preconceived intent to get the green card and immediately go work somewhere else. And USCIS finds out they do an audit uh, and they determine that you fraudulently obtained that green card to go work somewhere else, that could be an issue. Uh, but we if you had legitimately... That, we had that situation arise within the last year where we had someone who had an L1A and they received their green card, and then as soon as they received their green card, they immediately shut down their business operations. Um, had no intention of working there. Yeah, upon which their green card was based, and USCIS came back and they were doing an investigation on this individual... Um, you know, because they shut them down, like I want to say within a few months of receiving their green card. And then they do a site visit, they yeah, audit. They did a site visit and they saw nobody was working there. Revoke that green card. Yeah, it's a possibility. So, And not only that, then you can also face issues of fraud, right? If you mm -hmm. If they determine you did that fraudulently, then you could receive a bar for fraud. Not a good thing. All right. Question number three, can a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree with a major in film and television qualify for a graphic designer TN visa? Our company is a sales company dealing with motorcycles and parts 
and I've been a person identified by the firm. Oh, but the firm film and television major makes us feel uncertain. Please advise. Ooh, interesting. I actually just had a call very similar to this. Yeah, you did. I thought this one was going to was talking <laughs> about one. that call, and then I saw the motorcycle angle. So, yeah, maybe <laughs> these graphic designers work in all sorts of industries, which is great. Um, I had a similar call, but it was a tattoo artist. Right. And want to know if you could get a TN um, graphic designer as a tattoo artist. So I would say the answer is, can you get a graphic design TN doing this job? I, I would say absolutely. The job sounds like it would qualify for the position of a, or the profession of a graphic designer. I think the the company's ultimate concern here though is um the degree and that's a legitimate concern now and i i guess i had the uh, I advantage mean, of just researching this and looking at the department of labor ooh for a graphic for, designer but and for a bachelor of fine arts and really? for a bachelor yeah. of fine arts so i just looked at this literally minutes ago um but if you look up graphic designer in the Occupational Outlook Handbook for the Department of Labor and it talks about a graphic designer and how you qualify, it says you can qualify by having a bachelor's degree in graphic design or in fine arts in a closely related field. So it doesn't shut the door if you have a degree in a bachelor of fine arts. It's actually the field that graphic design falls under. Now, when you're, when you're analyzing this and determining whether or not this specific degree would qualify... And then it goes back to a memo that was released by the um, U.S. immigration that talks about closely related and what is closely related. Um, and we generally use a 50% rule when we, when we look at it. If you're looking at this individual's transcripts and their degree, well, if they have a degree in film and television, what course load in that degree actually entails graphic design? Yeah, what, what is related to graphic design? So you may be able to identify, maybe they had a minor in graphic design and they took 50% of their course load in that area or in classes that were related to it, this person might qualify. And even if it's not obvious on its face, depends on how bad you want that worker. Maybe you don't go to the border because it's too big of a risk. I would say the border, the border's harder to get these cases approved than it is by mail with USCIS. What you can do is you can file and see what USCIS says. You can file the petition with USCIS, make the best case possible that it's closely related. Who knows? USCIS might approve it. Mm -hmm. If they don't approve it, they'll let you know before they deny by issuing what's called a request for evidence. And if that request for evidence comes back and you don't think you can overcome it, then you could withdraw your application and give up on the process. But if you really need this individual, they meet your qualifications and you can't find anybody else, you file by mail with USCIS, see what they say. They could approve it, and the individual would then show up to the border with an approval notice and be on their way. And so um, closely related is difficult. You, with closely related, you, you, you never really know until you actually try. Um, yeah. But if it's too far off, then I would say it's not worth trying. Um, but if there are courses in there that do apply and you can argue that apply, then then it could, could be possible. Yeah, this person would truly benefit from our second level of uh, um, consultation where we would review the documentation and let them know whether or not we think they qualify. Well, thank you for tuning in to the Arrive podcast and have a great day.